Hello and welcome everybody to what is the last uh, webinar in our uh, MHP and Emerging Minds uh, online conference stream which we've been bringing to you over the last couple of weeks and um, tonight we're going to explore the impacts of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs as we might call them on parents. Uh, so welcome to the well over 300 of you who are um, currently logged in and um, to those of you who will be uh, watching us through the podcast, welcome. Um, uh, this, as I said, is uh, the conclusion of the, the online uh, conference stream on trauma which uh, Emerging Minds and MHPN have collaboratively produced and it's been a lot of fun um, joining with you over the last couple of weeks. Um, so as I said, tonight we're going to look at um, parents who experience uh, adverse childhood experiences or what we might call a... Before we start, as usual, Emerging Minds and MPHN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respects to the Elders past, present and future, to the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. This webinar is a final activity in the trauma, the impact of adverse childhood experiences contact stream in MHPN's online conference, Working Better Together. So uh, my name's Dan Moss and I'm the, the Workforce Development Manager at Emerging Minds and it's been a great privilege and pleasure to, to be um, uh, joining you for um, a number of web webinars uh, throughout the year and uh, we've had a lot of fun being able to bring those to you. Um, I'd like to present you with tonight's uh, panel um, before we go any further. First off, um, I'd like to um, introduce Courtney Sherman. Now Courtney um, is a social worker who currently is at Emerging Minds but has had um, much experience working with, with parents and children. So Courtney, I um, wonder if you could start off telling us a little bit about how as a social worker you've worked in parent sensitive ways with adults who have experienced ACEs while still maintaining a focus yeah. on the work. Um, hi Dan doing. and hi everyone that's um, listening. Um, I suppose it can be quite um, tricky doing um, the question that you've just asked. And, Often when you're working with um, families with complex trauma and who have experienced ACEs, you have a lot of uh, multiple and sometimes competing demands. I think um, first off we really need to partner with the parent um, and make sure that they feel supported by us. Um, one of the things that I've always done within my practice is make sure that um, child development and child wellbeing is discussed from the start the earliest possible conversation we can have with um, the parents about um, their child's well-being um, is obviously going to be the best because when we need to start raising issues of um, concerns, risks or issues, we um, it's not as daunting or as threatening. We're able to offer support and it becomes a normal part of our interaction. Um, the other thing is we know that um, adult issues can dominate interactions um, and overtake kind of the conversation when we're working with um, families. So always trying to link it back to um, the impact on the child and their well-being. And I think if we can kind of do that, it really starts to, to um, support families. Great. Thank you, Courtney. I really look forward to talking with you more tonight. Uh, our next panellist is Dr Mary Salver and many of you will know uh, Mary through her research work um, but also uh, Mary's worked as a psychologist and um, Mary I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about your, your breadth of experience including working with parents who have uh, experienced ACEs uh, and are involved with the statutory child protection system. Sure, thanks Dan. Um, so I've been a researcher for over 10 years um, at the University of South Australia at the Australian Centre for Child Protection and in that time I've been involved in undertaking um, research and evaluations of child protection programs, policies and practices. Um, my PhD research specifically examines the experiences of parents involved with statutory child protection involvement. Um, and, and specifically I wanted to understand what facilitated and inhibited parents 
um, involved, what helped them visit their children who had been removed because of child abuse and neglect, and, and the factors that inhibited um, them from doing that. And for parents, the removal of their children and their placement in care resulted in identity trauma, given the complete disturbance um, of their sense of self and contributed to the biasing that parents endured. And I hope I'll, I'll be able to explain this a little bit more in my talk. But um, I was also co-chairperson of the Family Inclusion Network of um, South Australia, and that was comprised of parents involved with statutory child protection, some who were able to navigate the system and have their children uh, returned, create the change, and have their children returned safely, and some who um, had their children in long-term care. There were also practitioners involved, um, and staff, uh, academics, um, practitioners from government and non-government agencies. But that group aimed to support parents and families to participate, participate equally and, and respectfully in the child protection process. Parents felt very powerless. They didn't understand, um, they didn't understand what, what was this child abuse and neglect um, because this was better than the, 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 the environments that they had grown up in. So it was about them learning the new parental identity, um, the system, and you know others wanted them to to to, to change to. So about it, that particular group was about advocating for parents, what their rights were, supporting them with information and access to legal services. So supporting them with teaching them about attachment, teaching them about the system, what, what was the expectations of the system, so really walking them um, through the change that we wanted to see um, for, for, their, for themselves and their children. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, our final presenter tonight, some of you will have, uh, would have heard from our previous, some of our previous webinars, is Professor Nick Karolenko. Um, and Nick, in psychiatry, um, Tell us a little bit about what you're mindful of when working with parents who have experienced ACE. Um, hello, Dan. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I think a lot of issues, um, which Mary touched upon, but there are probably a few crucial issues working with parents that have experienced ACE. And that's often that there's an experience either of shame or concern, uh, or I guess as Mary was alluding to, they might have some distorted ideas about parenting and what's good for kids. But even with all of that, they're usually quite committed uh, to wanting the best for their children. So that's kind of a, a platform on which you can often engage with them. Uh, if they also suffer with mental health problems, then also makes them real, really be a lot more sensitive to kind of raising these issues. But I think the, the issue Mary raised about that sense, the core sense uh, to identity provided by parenting is always a, an avenue for talking to, to parents about the significance of parenting in their lives. Uh, and they invariably value it, uh, they invariably you know, keep it at the front of their mind, but there's often a lot of barriers to talking about and being frank about it and all those kind of things. So often I, I sort of start with questions about, um, you know, what got you through in the experience of the parenting you had when you were growing up? What gets your children through now? And you can, that often will get people at least started off and going, and you get a sense of their strengths. Um, and you can always uh, ask about their kids to get them to tell you about the development of their children and make them, in a sense, the experts. So these are the kind of icebreakers, I think, to getting into issues about um, their experiences of parenting and potentially the impact of adverse child experiences that they also experienced in their own development. Thanks so much for that, Nick, and uh, definitely looking forward to hearing more of your presentations later on this evening. Thanks. Okay. Oh, I should just so mention, Dan, I'm not a professor, yes, though I might aspire to be, so I'm Dr. Nick Kolek. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've given, we, yeah, is that a, I'm not sure whether that's a promotion or not. Um, we'll take anyway, it, one. Yes, apologies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Yes. Okay, so let's um, just uh, think a little bit about the webinar platform that we have for you tonight. So um, we have uh, uh, Valeria and Joss um, on our chat box who are taking some questions. So this chat room is this general chat amongst other health professionals in the audience. Uh, we will discuss resources 
uh, that you might like to um, consume later in the webinar. If you do need some technical support, there's a technical support FAQs tab uh, at the top of your um, screen. Now at the end of tonight we're going to ask you to fill out a feedback form and um, by uh, clicking the feedback survey which is loaded under the survey tab at the bottom of the screen. So uh, we'd really appreciate it if you did that to kind of help us get better at what we're doing and what we're able to um, uh, provide for you. So tonight we've got some uh, learning outcomes um, and so at the webinar completion, what we'd really want you to be able to do is better understand how the long term effects of ACE impact on adults and their pain and the therapeutic approaches that help overcome these impacts. We want you to be able to implement tips and strategies for adults and parents to make meaning of their ACE and to ensure a practitioner focus on children's social and emotional well being when working with parents who have been affected by ACE. So uh, what is an ACE? So when we're talking tonight, which will be a lot around adverse childhood experiences, what we're really meaning is a potentially stressful or traumatic event experienced during childhood which can produce chronic or toxic stress responses in children that persist throughout the life course. They can have potentially profound impact on later development of chronic diseases, mental health issues or problems with other social so the most widely recognised and researched ACEs are childhood physical, sexual and emotional abuse, physical neglect and emotional neglect, exposure to family violence, parental substance abuse, parental illness, parental separation or divorce and parental incarceration. Okay, so tonight our presenters will be guiding you through our case study. So you might remember for those of you who tuned in for our um, ACE uh, presentation on working with children. We worked with UT, who at the time was six years old and was now in care. So tonight's presentation, we want to go back three years. We want to be working with uh, T's parents, birth parents, when she was still in the household, and seeing what preventative early intervention conversations that we might be able to have with T's parents when she was three, with Janet and Justin. Uh, so now I'm going to ask Courtney uh, to talk about um, that from a social work social working perspective. Courtney. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm going to present. Um, I've got three slides, and before I present the slides, I just want to make sure that these aren't meant to be in a fixed linear um, process. It's something that would consistently happen through a case plan intervention, um, but it's just the way it's set out for the webinar. So first off, um, my first slide is about engagement. And I don't think that we can stress this more. Our ability to engage with the family and be really respectful and empathetic during our engagement is something that we really need to concentrate on. Now, we know from practice wisdom, but we also know from evidence that families that come from history with child protection, out of home care, trauma, abuse and neglect, they can be very untrusting of the service system. So we really need to be transparent and really actively listen. The other um, interesting complexity with this case is something that we really need to acknowledge is that these two parents were children of the child protective system until very recently and now that's changed into now they're the parents. So that's something that um, I'd be quite conscious of and seeing what um, complexities can come from that, additional complexities. Um, the other thing is to make sure that we meet the family where they're at. Um, we can come in as social workers and professionals and have a thousand goals of where we want this family to be, but that's not what we're, where they want to be and they might not be ready for that change. So we need to really listen to what their hopes, their fears, and their aspirations for themselves, but also their children are. Um, and most importantly, we shouldn't be setting them up to fail. We know that families with trauma, ACEs, and a range of other issues um, need some additional support and also might not be functioning to the level that is expected, I suppose, of them. 
Um, and now the next slide that we have, that I have is assessment. And I'm not talking about a diagnostic assessment here. I'm talking about trying to find um, as much information as we can about the family in a quieter, supportive and therapeutic way. And I've put two things up on the screen now as one is a genogram and the other one is an eco map. And these are something that I use in my practice all the time. I find that um, genograms can be a really therapeutic process um, and it can allow the client to have a visual representation of their family, where they've come from, um, where they are now and where they want to be. It's also an opportunity to allow clients to perhaps lift um, or shed some shame of and to see their family circumstances so they can see the intergenerational trauma, they can see um, ACEs and relationship disruptions and they might be able to see patterns where they want to um, really work on those areas so it's not the same for um, their child. Now, if I had the opportunity, I would really get T involved with this. And when I do denigrate families, it's something that um, I really want to make fun. So I really want to be able to kind of hop on the ground with them, get the pens out, get the textures out, and make it a really collaborative experience. Um, so if I could get T involved in that, that would be something that I would really be striving to do. If not, this would be a place to really ask some of those explorative questions about um, maybe perhaps to Justin of what was it like with your mum before your stepfather came along? Um, what are your hopes for tea? Um, what was it like for you as a child? And this can be done in quite a trauma informed way as you're not sitting across from the family with a notebook, you're sitting side by side. So you're kind of, you partner with them in an activity. Um, the other thing that I really use is eco maps and I find this is really important um, and it can help the family kind of um, see what their social supports are, what they have um, in the community if they're in formal or formal supports but it might also help them see that maybe they've only got friends that are involved in substance misuse. Do they have supportive friends or supportive families that they can um, draw on for parenting advice perhaps. Um, the other thing is what connection does T have to the community? We know that um, children that are connected to the community have a sense of stability um, but also what does she need to be able to, um, what would support her with her social and emotional well-being? So is she connected with her peer group? Does she go to a childcare? Does she go to a play group? Um, I find that um, by having these drawn out, it can really support families with that. And my last slide is some of the approaches that I would use. Now, these aren't the only approaches that I'd use, but these are definitely the ones that come to mind. So we have a family with um, uh, high levels of trauma, high levels of ACEs. So being trauma informed and being trauma informed is something that I would do with all families, um, not just the ones that we know come from a trauma background. Um, I also think it's really important that you don't actually need to know what the trauma is to work this way and it's not about going on a dig to find out because um, that can be quite triggering to families. Um, what we also know is we've received a substantial bit of information in the referral with regards to the, their background uh, but that not, might not be all. There could be some quiet, there could be things that the parents aren't telling us, there could be things that have happened but maybe they're too ashamed to talk about it so we always need to approach it with we don't know everything. Um, the other approach is motivational interviewing. Now this is something that I've primarily done um, what I'd use with Justin. I need to find out a little bit more about Janet's ID and what her functioning is. So it might be to really kind of use the emotion, uh, motivational interviewing with Justin is he has more of a reflective capacity and see if we can get Janet doing some more practical tasks of um, parenting. Now the last one is um, child development and I've put chronological versus developmental age. So we know when we have families that have had 
extensive amount of trauma is their chronological age doesn't actually match their developmental age. I think this is really important as I would be surprised if T is um, developmentally three, but I'd also be very surprised if the parents were developmentally 17 as we know that the history that they've had. So what approaches do we need to use as professionals to adapt our language and style um, to support the parents to understand what we're talking about, but also to support them with their, ch their child and her development. Justin's mentioned um, a couple of things in the case study that um, he really enjoys having tea around, but doesn't enjoy the crying. So what does that mean? How can we um, get Justin to understand that perhaps T's crying is a way for, is her only way of communicating because she doesn't have the language. Um, but really focusing on what it means, how children develop. Janet said that she really loves T, so building on that, what else do children need to really support their development? Loves one, but what else can we work with that? So really harvesting the strengths. Um, that's my last slide for the moment, so I'll hand it back to you, Dan. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, and I have to say that is one of the most impressive uh, genograms I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think you threw in the Game of Thrones reference as well. Uh, yeah. Very topical. I do, I do <laughs> like it detailed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just to let people know that uh, apparently we've had some feedback that we do have, we have had a, a couple of sound issues and we're endeavouring to get to the bottom of those. So hopefully that improves really soon. Okay, uh, I'm now going to uh, invite uh, Dr. Mary Salveron to um, talk uh, through the, the case study from a psychologist's perspective. Mary. Thanks, Dan. So we know from research that adverse childhood experiences have lifelong Sorry, lifelong impacts and consequences. So ultimately you see it on the screen, it impacts on one's, um, you know, those who've experienced um, adver ACEs are at higher risk of experiencing psychological disorders, personality disorders, um, addictive disorders, um, social isolation, poor learning and employment outcomes. And in, in addition, they're more likely to develop heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, and so on, and, and more likely to die of suicide. Um, ultimately, how one views themselves, how one manages their stress, how they um, manage their emotions, how one learns, how one reflects, and how one interacts with others. These are the long-term impacts of adverse childhood experiences. So we know that the therapeutic alliance is vital. Um, so the approach or stance that I would take would be a compassionate, empathic, and non-blaming one focused on establishing rapport and trust with Janet and Justin. So this means providing a safe place to listen actively to their stories, being open with them in order to understand the world through their eyes. Both have experienced significant and cumulative traumas over their lives, from abuse from Justin's stepdad to multiple placements for Janet since her own childhood. Because of what we know about the impact of ACEs, I'm aware that Janet and Justin may view the world in a certain way, one that's uncertain and unpredictable, perhaps negative and pessimistic, that they may be guarded and not as trusting. So I imagine Janet and Justin may be overwhelmed by confusing facts, current and potential problems, and necessary decisions to be made. So by offering them assistance in deciding um, what issues to be faced first and, and problems that need solving now, we can begin alleviating some of that distress. Work with Janet and Justin will aim to build their personal resources, their strengths, understanding their family ecology, with the aim of building their autonomy and responsibility, motivating them that they have choices, that they can take control, and they have the power to create change. I want to stress here that while parent worker engagement is critical, I need to highlight that engagement is necessary, but it is not enough for children's safety. Ultimately, for things to change for T, there needs to be changes in Janet and Justin's behaviour that acknowledge and meet T's needs as a three-year-old who is dependent on her parents for survival. T's safety is priority here, and the current information we have about Janet and Justin suggests they're struggling to look after T. If we find that Janet's metamphetamine use is 
very frequent and severe, and T's needs are not being met, support from a medical withdrawal service or even more optimal is a community residential treatment where Janet can be supported to get treatment with T, which can focus on repairing the bond between them and supporting their physical and mental health, interpersonal and social skills, and T's development. And supporting T's relationship with Dad Justin is just as which means, as um, Courtney alluded to before, unpacking what Justin means when he says he likes having tea around, but he doesn't have energy to put up with her constant crying. Does he have fears about being a dad? What are they? Again, modelling, showing, demonstrating what conversations and interactions could look like with the, with the three-year-old would be key. Talking about the routine she needs, that she copies and imitates, she engages in pretend play, she can follow simple instructions, and, and she sees and make, is trying to make sense of the world. Cases like Justin and Janet's are complex and require an intensive long-term view of support involving a multi-D team. What I'd like to focus um, over the next few slides is on case conceptualization of Justin and Janet's situation. So case conceptualization is a way of organizing the information gathered for developing the story that explains the underlying mechanism of Janet and Justin's presenting problems. The conceptualization is collaborative, which means it is done with Janet and Justin, and it's dynamic, which means it's that new information comes on hand, formulation is reviewed, added to, and changed. So case formulation puts seven, seven Ps into context. What is Janet and Justin's presenting problem? What is the pattern and onset? What predisposed them to the problem? What precipitated or triggered the problem? what perpetuated the problem, what are the protective factors, and what's the prognosis. I would acknowledge to Janet and Justin that they are the expert at their lives. They know what's going on, and that my knowledge is about how problems start and how problems keep going. And together we can come to understand the problems and put to practice uh, the different strategies to overcome them. Case conceptualization is really important because it provides an overall uh, picture of Janet and Justin's situation. It helps clarify questions that I might have. It helps prioritize issues and problems. It helps plan treatment and strategies. It can even predict responses to interventions and identify barriers to progress. So for Janet and Justin, the presenting problem here, maybe Janet's is Janet's methamphetamine use on parenting T and not meeting her developmental needs. I would seek to find how do Janet and Justin understand from their perspective what the problem is. I'd seek to understand the pattern and onset of the problem. Did the drug taking start only recently after a crisis? Um, the third point, predisposing factors are those that make Janet and Justin more likely to behave in a particular way and this would come from their histories and past experiences. The precipitating, Precipitating factors are about the events leading up to the crisis, which may come from different sources. Are there ways that the trajectory could be changed to prevent drug taking? For this case, many factors could be maintaining the problem. Finding out from Janet about the role or the function of methamphetamines, for example, is it to alleviate or escape the intense pain of abandonment, loss and rejection she has endured over the last 20 years? We may be able to learn about the hurtful and negative that Janet tells herself, which influences the way she feels about herself and the behaviours she engages to numb that pain. These, some of these, um, what I'm talking about, came, uh, had come from my PhD, so I'm hearing families. Um, so where do Janet and Justin think we can begin to break that cycle that keep problems going? Important to mention here also is obtaining from Janet and Justin what their goals in our work together look like. Collaboratively find ways to know we're making progress and, and we're moving towards those goals. The protective factors are next, and they aim to draw the, um, the, the strengths of, of Justin and Janet um, that buffer against the challenges, and also activating the interpersonal resources, the social supports. Have there been times when Janet was feeling well and coped without substances? What supported her then, and how do we build the, and implement those strategies again? And in terms of the prognosis, this will depend on the context uh, where we are working from, where we may be obliged to um, indicate a, a probable outcome for Justin, Janet and the family. By using the case conceptualization as the anchor with which to work with Janet and Justin, effective interventions can be used to directly target and respond to the complexity of their needs rather than the way around. 
rather than fitting um, Janet and Justin to a, a particular parenting program or an approach. So one of the things I wanted to quickly speak about was a cognitive behavioural approach. So cognitive, uh, core components of uh, CBT comprise of psychoeducation. So I'd want to be increasing Janet and Justin's insight into their own trauma, triggers, symptoms, reactions such as the dysregulated um, or survival coping strategies of substance abuse and depressive symptoms like um, helping Janet and Justin understand their minds and themselves. Cognitive restructuring is about supporting Janet and Justin make sense of their unhelpful thoughts and about themselves and begin developing and strengthening um, alternative narratives. Management of emotions, so that would be supporting them um, to adopt a range of health promoting behaviours such as the importance of sleep, not too much and not too little, eating nutrient rich foods, exercising, physical activity, really developing their sense of self and agency and their connections with other people. And of course the problem solving skills are really, really important. Um, this is demonstrating steps to find solutions. So this may be as simple as helping them complete necessary forms to access services, linking them and getting them food, those basic needs. Um, talking to Janet about contraception, so real issues that they're facing. And again, the adaptive um, skills, um, adaptive coping skills and interpersonal skills are focused on developing positive, supportive and helpful strategies and relationships that present um, Justin and Janet's uh, minds and bodies with positive inputs. So, and we want them to be, encourage them, motivate them to practice these new skills and strategies again and again. So that will be key in our work together. Um, I just wanted to finally finish and just show you the findings of uh, the, my PhD research and highlight the broad theme of fighting. So parents, I interviewed parents, carers and practitioners involved with statutory child protection intervention. And there was this broad theme of fighting that had positive and negative dimensions and internal and external facets. Parents were ultimately fighting for and fighting against factors within themselves and things outside of themselves after statutory child protection involvement and the removal of their children and as they navigated through the process. If as a society and a system we can meaningfully engage and support families, move from that top right green box where parents are fighting against the system and powerlessness to the purple top left box where they're fighting positive children, can we support them reconstruct their parental identities so that they're ultimately better able to care for their children, themselves and their families. Back to you Dan. Thank you, Mary. That was uh, really um, comprehensive and interesting um, and getting um, lots of questions in our, our chat room about um, case conceptualisation in particular. So thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to um, hand over to Dr. Definitely Dr. Uh, Nick Kowalenko um, to talk from a psychiatrist view. Nick. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and thank you to my panellists because um, of course they've um, discussed a number of issues and so I'll, I'll kind of step around some of the things that they've covered well uh, as we go through um, my slides. Um, so as you know we're sort of focusing in a sense on Justin and Janet and their experiences. So often we're, you know, we're, we're thinking child first usually but in this particular instance we're thinking about the impact of ACEs uh, on, our, on the two parents Justin and Janet. And I'll just pick out a, a couple of kind of features of that. Just one of Justin's historical experiences is of abuse at the hand of his stepfather. And we also kind of note that he doesn't want to be much more than a part-time dad. Um, so you know, one, one thread of asking him about his experience of, of being parented um, might be about um, what was that experience like for him, but of course that might be a bit too confronting at first. Perhaps you could ask him about uh, when he experienced these you know, adverse experiences such as abuse by a stepfather. What did mum do to, to help him out? Could mum be relied upon? Uh, how did mum respond? Uh, all, all those sorts of aspects. And then ultimately we could get to some questions but it would take many steps and some good curious questioning to get to this notion of does he think that impacted on his sense of wanting to be a part-time dad for T? So is he kind of trying to protect T from the potential dangers or demons that continue in his own life or his own head regarding his experiences of abuse and fathers being 
yeah, abusive towards their children. So this, that's kind of what might be one area we'd want to go in. Janet's had a lot of parents, foster parents. She's had, maybe she's had foster siblings uh, who she might remain close to or not. So there's a whole lot of kind of parenting figures in Janet's life and that might present some challenges about who's been most reliable, who's been consistent. Uh, and we have, if we have a look there at um, some of the experiences that Janet's had, um, we could just see perhaps this one about, um, uh, just can't see it, I'll just have to bring it up a bit in size here. Uh, these kind of range of questions that we've got there um, and we'll explore them a bit more now in my next uh, slide. So as we mentioned, Justin uh, has had this experience of abuse, had a mum react. Um, often this really at least starts a conversation about saying most parents want the very best for their kids and sometimes they feel that things can get in the way of their parenting. What do you think you know, in that domain for you? Um, and in a sense, uh, he's made a commitment to being a part-time father. Let's imagine what would be the impact of full-time fathering on you, Justin. What would happen, do you think? He tells us he hasn't really got a clue. Oh, so that could have a bit more uh, exploration about um, what, what sort of ideas has he got if he hasn't got clues? Um, and how would he go about trying to get some clues? Because we know that for early parents, especially in those first two or three years of our kids' lives, same for everyone, we get so many of the clues about parenting from fellow parents and our peers who are trying to parent their kids. Uh, and that's often where we learn so much of it. Is that a possibility for Justin? So these are kind of opening up opportunities or possibilities in the way that um, uh, Courtney's talked about the kind of eco-map potential and matching. He talks about the impact of crying, uh, doesn't like it. What is his response to crying? What, what happens when your baby cries? Uh, does it make you feel frustrated? You know, so you can, you can give some clues. I wonder if this hearing tie Having hearing tea cries makes you feel stressed, frustrated, makes you want to run. Uh, getting a sense of what it is that his experience might be with that. Uh, Janet's had quite a story of kind of ruptured care and ruptured continuity in that care. We want to know a bit more about how this occurred and why. Because I think in her story she tells us that um, there's a sense of blaming herself for that. Uh, none of the foster placements seem to work. That's often uh, an experience that uh, kids who have been in foster care report uh, and often it's a sign that they bring in a sense the failure of the unsuccessful foster care onto themselves. Whereas often we find when we peel back the history of that, they've experienced serious adverse events in foster care that can also include abuse and other experiences. And sometimes that's the cause of frequent moves in foster care. So that's one neat bit that needs a bit of unpacking because that might help uh, Janet understand a bit more about uh, the sense of foster care may not have been of the quality that she needed to experience more continuous uh, quality kind of parenting in her own right. There's a strong sense about uh, Janet wanting a sort of experience of love and what is it she's hoping for? So much of what we can bring I think to the table about parenting in children, talking about children of course, what is the hope? What's the Hi folks, welcome back. Um, and uh, uh, we've just had, a, a, as you would know, we've just had a slight technical hitch. Um, Nick, I reckon we got um, to about the third of your slides before um, you cut out. Um, okay. Uh, what I might do is, um, just in, encourage you to, to maybe go back to about your third slide and we might go from there. So apologies uh, to our audience. Um, sorry about that everybody, we just had some slight technical issues and uh, we'll now uh, ask Nick to, to continue his presentation. Thanks for hanging on in there. Hello, yes, sorry about that everyone. Uh, so I think we were talking about Janet um, and why don't I just focus on one of the themes uh, in the snippets of information we have about Janet. And that's a sense, uh, the hope of love, the hope of tea. Um, and what was it she was hoping for? So what was the kind of experience she was anticipating or expecting? Because we know her own experience is, really, is of ruptured parenting uh, with you know, discontinuity and intermittent care. Uh, and some of that might be complicated by um, 
adverse experiences that she too has experienced in foster care uh, or alternative care? Uh, does she have contact um, with her foster siblings and foster parents? Uh, and I think um, Mary had talked about the importance of understanding Janet's um, triggers to drug use because it's intermittent. Um, as I mentioned, Janet has this kind of theme about wanting to experience love. Um, and how's that going with Justin and his support for her uh, in parenting tea? Uh, and others of you have talked about these aspects about uh, her addiction. For T uh, herself, of course, preventing out of home care is a critical issue here. And I think both Mary and uh, Courtney have focused on the importance of a consistent, intensive approach to that being implemented uh, in this example. Um, we don't know much about uh, potential antenatal amphetamine exposure, and that could well have serious effects on T's development. Uh, and we would be really keen to know about her psychosocial emotional development, and particularly her language development in the context potentially of neglect. We don't really know the extent of neglect, so we might want to know something about that in terms of um, the size, in a sense, of the impact as an adverse child experiences for T herself. Uh, with T's difficulties uh, that we could kind of uh, anticipate, um, parenting her is actually going to be more difficult. And that sometimes can help uh, parents like um, Janet uh, understand about the sort of demands that, in, in a sense, increase skill in parenting. And it can be a bridge to accepting more support, parenting support. Uh, and in fact, T's experience of inconsistent care and sort of relationship quality when Janet goes in and out of use, will stress a T, and she'll actually react more. So these are kind of the contributors that could complicate the, the difficulties in her being parented. Uh, I think um, this is kind of the language that uh, Courtney introduced, does take a village in terms of the eco map and all those things. Safety and monitoring, as Mary emphasized, really is priority one. But what are the strengths, too, which I guess Mary raised? What is Justin's reliability in this family? Um, and how is he committed or what gets in the way of his commitment here uh, is a kind of key issue. And we could talk with him a bit about what is the sense, how much closeness to T does he want to manage, how does he think that works, what's the impact of that on Janet, etc. There are a group here of intergenerational ACEs, which I've just picked out some of them here. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, you're already, without trying too hard for T, there's at least six, half a dozen ACEs. And once you're at that kind of level between four and six, the adverse impacts that Mary described so well can really have their impact. We don't know much, uh, even genetically, about what's the cause uh, of Janet's um, developmental disability. Uh, we don't know about the impact uh, of um, potential for illness, and certainly with parents with amphetamine use, we often see quite serious weight loss during pregnancy and things like that. But we know about the importance in this particular instance right now about the need for a persistent, uh, reliable, intensive intervention. Uh, Mary raised this issue, is it time for drug rehab? Uh, some instances that can occur with under three-year-olds, and that's a real help uh, often for mums uh, in terms of entering rehab and persisting with it is having their baby with them because it really does keep them uh, embedded uh, in rehab often. Uh, my experience in working with um, mums with mild development disability is that the power of imitation, of watching, and the fit minds is often the time visiting nurses, working with them, with them and working with their infants is the critical step where learning really care occurs, especially in someone like uh, Janet with her own experience and in her, in her head, her own memories, her own recollections, her own experiences of good quality parenting might be very limited. And that probably increases the need for kind of imitating observed good parenting. As I mentioned, there might be some health risks and Mary also raised the issues of chronic illnesses in mum uh, and the issues of how this might affect T's growth. Um, so that's kind of, um, I've talked about a, a, bit, a bit about um, T about T's uh, impact and T's experience of parenting and the parenting capacity of both Justin and Janet in a number of domains. We've talked about ACEs uh, or ACEs 
in this wide variety of domains potentially impacting on tea and intergenerationally going back generations. Um, Courtney's um, genogram was fabulous and of course in particular settings sometimes we can do genograms that stretch back uh, in Aboriginal populations. So Judy Atkinson um, mm. really championed the idea of traumograms where you go back in family history delineating trauma and ACEs often through several generations and this might be one of those families uh, in Janet's case in particular. Uh, and wanting the best for the baby might even include temporary kinship placement. So this might be a kind of avenue uh, about collaborative working in the best interest of the child which might help parents get back on track. So it's really about keeping all the options open and doing it in a collaborative and supportive way. Some of these kind of questions might be around these issues. What are your hopes for your baby's child? What are your hopes for how you best want to love her? And how do you imagine your baby loving you? What's got you through as a parent? Who could you rely on when you were a kid? So those kind of ways in to asking parents about those things. So thank you very much and sorry about the glitch. Uh, and of course we're really happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, so one of the, the questions that, that we'd like to ask you about um, your excellent presentation was um, you talked there about Justin and the fact that he was um, abused by his own stepfather um, and you um, talked a little bit about the fact that that might have uh, given him an idea of um, uh, the protection and, and his own kind of ethical kind of considerations of the sort of dad and the sort of protective figure he'd like to be. Can you just say a bit more about that? Yeah, so we've got a bit of a story about um, Justin's, you know, wanting to be a part-time dad, not having a clue about how to be a dad. Uh, wanting Mary, uh, wanting wanting um, Janet to do a better job as a mum, so they're all kind of, in one sense, distancing, you know, from the, the serious task of being a committed parent. But the kind of issue to raise there is, you could be curious about that uh, as someone interviewing the family, because the curiosity would be about, well, God, I'm wondering if, um, you know, Justin, it looks like your experience of fathering wasn't that good. Is that right? I've understood that. So you're kind of always taking this position where you're inviting Justin to comment. Or have I got that wrong? I didn't quite want to understand that. And I, I just wondered if sometimes, you know, when uh, children and dads are close, do you kind of have a worry that violence might break out or do you, do you worry about their safety? And so it's possible that a way of positively connoting uh, what Justin is doing is that in a sense he's wanting to protect T from his potential sudden outburst of anger or violence and those sorts of things. It's not uncommon uh, you know, in couples where uh, drug use occurs that there's quite distorted thinking and sometimes violence. Uh, and violence sometimes goes with this pattern um, of particularly dads um, as part of their controlling kind of style wanting mums to do much better with their kids. So there's kind of a lot of issues there and I guess we haven't talked specifically about whether this is a couple which uh, might well experience domestic violence, but there's certainly some non-specific flags that suggest that's an area worth exploring. So uh, coming back to your, your specific question, Dan, uh, it's a kind of mix of is, um, is Janet safe, firstly? Is T safe in this environment? And then secondly, is, is kind of uh, Justin holding himself back, holding himself from the full commitment of kind of being a dad, want to be a part-time dad, because in some way he feels that's a safer way for T to grow up and develop. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Nick. Um, really interesting um, insights. So thank you, Courtney. Um, uh, lots of interest in your amazing genograms, but one uh, one really interesting question. In when using genograms as part of, of your th therapeutic process, can you tell us about the steps you might take with families uh, where adversity uh, and trauma are present, um, so that you can ensure safety? Yeah, um, for sure. Um, I know that some practitioners can shy away from the use of genograms, especially when we're working with. Um, families from um, child protection or out of home care backgrounds because it can be um, quite triggering. I suppose it's very much about um, talking with the client, getting them to see um, the benefit and how it would work out. 
um, really kind of um, no surprises. So it's not about rocking up to the um, home visit that day and say, oh, we're doing a genogram. It's about really floating the idea um, over a number of visits. Um, of course, gaining consent that they want to do this. Um, explain to them the reasons why we want to do it, but also make it fun. Um, I think when you are doing it, being very mindful of um, where the clients come from, what their presentation is during the visit, but also um, if you're working with a family um, as large as the genogram example that I provided, you're going to have to do it over a couple of visits. It's not just going to be one visit. Um, and just take it as a pace and let the family know that they can stop and start or park it for a little bit and continue when they need to. Um, but I've rarely had a family that said, no, I don't want to do this. It's always been like, okay, I'm going to give it a go. Um, and normally once that they've got into it, it's actually a really good process. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, uh, next question is for you, Mary. Um, uh, so tonight we've talked about adverse childhood experiences, uh, but we've also touched upon intergenerational trauma and developmental trauma. So can you tell us about how those three um, concepts might be similar? Thanks, Dan. Yes, they, they are. I think it, it, it just um, uh, language, uh, depending on the discipline we come from, um, um, we refer to them differently depending on the discipline. But ultimately, when a child is exposed to um, overwhelming stress and their caregiver um, is unable to reduce that stress or maybe contributing or causing that stress, the child experiences developmental trauma. So most clinicians are familiar with the term PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, but the vast majority of traumatized children will not develop PTSD. Instead, they're at a risk for a host of complex emotional, cognitive and physical illness, um, illnesses that last throughout their lives. So some also refer to complex PTSD and this um, refers to um, the, a response of a repeated prolonged expect, uh, um, repeated experience of um, trauma and these adverse childhood experiences. So um, they're, they're all the same thing. <laughs> If I could just comment now, so the, the big thing is the accumulation of, mm. um, of the sort of adverse child's experiences. So that, you know, the large numbers of kids will face one or two uh, adverse child experiences and bounce back in a sense. It's when you get to more than four that some of the risks for the long-term sequelae crop up. And once you're at six or more, then it really escalates very quickly the chances for adverse kind of outcomes in terms of learning, development, um, school functioning, and the other risks that you talked about more in the long run, such as the mental health problems and the physical problems, that's when they really kick in. Once you've got a, a stack, an accumulation of more than about six, six or more. Yeah. Yeah. So Nick, um, when you're working with, with, with parents um, and thinking about um, their children's uh, mental health, do you uh, deliberately and explicitly talk about children's mental health with, with parents? Uh, I will talk very specifically about you know the importance of relationships and being close. I'll ask them about um, what do they think you know the factors that support resilience in their kids and but oh you know language like bounce back what what helps your kids bounce back um, so that's often what I focus on. Um, your question about mental health is a really good one because if we look at um, T in this particular case example, um, we know that um, you know that snippet, you know that roughly was it about that a minute uh, of the sort of snippet we had as the preparation for this. We hear, I think, it's our foster parents talking about their concerns about T's, um, you know, wanting to approach strangers and hugging them and getting close to them, approaching people in the street and being like, you know, very close and want to be part of them. And it's highly likely, um, you know, that, that T really has an, a, prob a, a significant problem with how she relates relating to her attachment, really as a, a function potentially of neglect that she may have experienced. So that's not often considered a mental health problem, but of course it can be. That can be a problem of a disturbed attachment or distorted attachment. Um, and that it's, so that, that can sometimes help 
um, particularly foster parents or parents, it's part of what I was sort of introducing is this idea that um, should T you know, be already lagging in terms of our own development, um, then parenting is actually going to be a lot more difficult. And that's partly what you're getting, I think, in that feedback from the foster parents. Parenting T is a lot more difficult. Mm. You know, she's much more subject to emotional um, kind of regulation up and down. She tells them she hates them. So you've got really strong emotions that she can't manage. Plus she's got this really fundamental uh, problem about how she relates to people. And in fact, in a sense, she's so attention seeking that she'll hug people who are strangers. And of course, you can see how in the long run, that's potentially a risk unless it can be you know, reverted because it may, puts her at risk of approaching people, strangers, you know, incredibly warmly, almost intimately, and potentially putting her at risk. So there's already, there are some mental health problems already emerging uh, in this, but um, it's always a kind of judgment call about how much you call the mental health problems because people often hear that as mental illness from which my kid will never recover. Uh, but there are other common mental health problems, you know, like ADHD and all the others that arise uh, that are, in a sense, much more readily accepted and discussed. But regardless of whether you talk about mental illness or not, I think the issue is that you can identify the problems and talk about them and ways to address them. Hmm. Thank you. I don't know, if, um, I, yeah, I don't know if, my, if my panel members want to comment on that because um, Mary kind of touched upon that but didn't really explore it. But certainly an example um, with T, uh, she's a kid who looks like from a relational point of view and her capacity for relationships, she's already in trouble. Hmm. Yeah, Mary, would you, would you like to comment on that? Um. I mean, supporting T, uh, supporting T with, um, and the foster, I'm, I'm not familiar, sorry, with the, the, the other case study, but certainly supporting T with her emotional regulation um, and keep it in a safe environment um, and ensuring um, is really, really critical. Um, and not seeing, the, not, not seeing it as um, the behaviours of, of, of T, but um, their symptoms of what she has experienced in her short life. Hmm. Thank you, Mary. Um, so we've, we've also got a um, question from Anusha um, in the chat room, um, uh, which is a great question, really talking about um, how do the panellists manage parents' expression of shame? Uh, when they are discussing uh, their children's well-being and the fact that this might make them a little bit more reluctant um, to engage in conversations. Courtney, I wonder um, if you'd like to respond to that. Um, I think it's a great question and I think that um, for me it's really about, um, oh I think there's a lot of ways that you can respond and no real words are kind of coming to my head but um, I think that when we're working with families with complex issues and um, trauma background, shame is a very normal emotion to have. So kind of really supporting them through that and normalising it um, in, a, in a way that's not going to obviously impact on child safety is a, is a really good approach. But I think as professionals, we really need to be able to have the skills to sit there in that uncomfortable space. Um, because if we're uncomfortable in that space, the family's going to be uncomfortable. So to kind of work through that together, um, I'm not sure if I've 100% answered the, the question there, Dan. Dan, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry about that. Um, so um, I might now throw to you, Mary. Mary, um, uh, what do you find uh, important in terms of working with, uh, with parents uh, who might be feeling a sense of shame or who also might be feeling a, a reluctance or a resistance to engaging with you in therapy? Well, we know that parent worker engagement is crucial in supporting the change necessary for, for adults who've experienced um, 
um, adverse child, uh, childhood experiences or developmental trauma. If there is um, that disengagement or resistance from parents or adults, I, I would look at, I mean this, is, this says more about our approaches and our style of interactions with those um, whom we are serving. So we, resistance um, happens when we um, expect or push for change when the parent may not be ready for that uh, change. And we would expect that this is normal because change is hard, change is really difficult. Um, when, when there's that resistance, um, I would be open to exploring um, that, those emotions, those really strong emotions with parents. Um, empathise with them. Um, develop discrepancy, um, so, uh, such as you know, some of the behaviours don't mesh with um, the important goals. So you say that um, your children are really, really important but um, you're, not putting, you're not able to put their needs first. How do we work with that? So change won't occur without um, a discrepancy. Um, so highlighting for the parent where that, that gap may be and, and where they're at and where they want to be is really, really important. So that change talk, keeping them at that change talk. Um, but first of all, again, remember these the parents are, um, who've experienced adverse childhood experiences are working at that threat stress response. So it's impulsive, it's reactive, um, we're thinking action first and thinking comes later. So if we are able to create a relationship with them, build that trust, understand that shame, that this isn't, isn't, want, isn't what, that, what they wanted for their children and this was better than what they had when they were, were, were um, growing up themselves and that we can create that discrepancy, support them through that change. Um, I think is um, yeah really important. Thank you so much, Mary. That, that's a really really great answer to that question, um, and uh, to be thinking about the importance of engagement. So we're now um, moving towards the the final stages of our uh, webinar tonight, uh, which has been uh, really interesting and engaging. Um, and uh, so I thank all of our, our panelists for their um, excellent presentations and, and answers to our questions. Uh, what I'm going to do now is hand over to each of our panelists just to um, uh, sum up for a couple of minutes and to, to leave us with maybe a final observation. So Courtney, I might start with you if that's okay. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I think to, to sum up what we've discussed here is really something that um, Nick was talking about, is that ACEs are actually relatively common. Um, and yes, when we get into the pointy end of six or more and start to see some real um, developmental concerns and later in life health concerns. But to always be mindful that when we're working with families and especially parents is that it's likely that they are going to have a number of ACEs and there's always be trauma informed and to always keep um, the children's wellbeing and safety in the forefront. Um, we all work with highly complex families and sometimes I think complexity is becoming um, more and more. Um, so really use some of the tools that we've discussed here to break down those cases and try and um, really don't ever underestimate the importance of engaging with a family. We know all about the therapeutic alliance and if you're not able to get um, have those conversations with families, really use your supervision space to really kind of see where you can um, kind of enhance your engagement skills. I think that's probably the most I have to say, so I might hand it back over there. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Mary, I might hand over to you now. So I just wanted to um, finish off with talking about um, supporting parents through that uh, therapeutic alliance about reconstructing their sense of self. So it's about learning, supporting them to learn new ways of seeing themselves, managing um, the stress differently, learning to regulate and manage their emotions. Um, so this may be a range of, of activities to be able to do this, keeping them relaxed and calm rather than angry and in, in, this, in that stress response. Um, teaching them to learn that asking for help doesn't mean that they're failing, that they're a community 
you know, you want to, we want to be able to activate their interpersonal resources, personal resources and community resources. So it's supporting them be able to reflect and, and also develop those healthy relationships with other people. So, and, and that can't, that we can't be create that change until we have an alliance and a relationship with them. Back to you, Dan. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, and Nick, I'll now ask you for final comments and observations. Thanks, Dan. Um, look, I think the, the panellists really highlighted the, uh, the essence of the requirement for safety and security in a relationship. But there's two things uh, you're often holding in balance. Um, in, you know, I'm partly spitting off the question about shame, is that in the context of shame, it usually means you've got to go slowly and carefully. You have to be collaboratively alongside parents as a way of you know, establishing trust. Uh, and uh, it's where this sort of curious approach to some extent that so we've been talking about a lot um, in these, this series of seminars is really important because it's the not knowing bit and getting them to fill in the information and the space because that's where the shames might pop out. The shame drives avoidance. So a lot of these, these families that we see avoid services like the plague let alone if they've been badly treated by them, and it's often a case for you know for people like in Jan's situation, uh, and and that avoidance is what is, can only be addressed very slowly. But the tipping point, the balance point, is what about T? T can't actually wait a very long time for the kind of slow work to happen, but it has to happen because the only way to manage the parents' difficulties and shame. Uh, and and I guess the thing I want to just to make people look very clear about is that teasing is serious trouble. And he's in trouble at a very serious relationship level. And the, her best bet is care by her parents and the support for her parents. But what's missing in the story is the extent of the intense uh, engagement with parents to make them safe and secure enough to be T's parents. So that's the kind of bit that's critical. I think uh, the only thing that I think Mary touched upon a bit earlier was the importance of peers. So then in, in one of the services I worked with kind of works across this kind of mental health, um, child protection, drug and alcohol interface, uh, is that one of the things we work to do to engage parents is get them, the, the ones entering the sort of program, to meet with other parents in the family. Because this is another way of modulating the impact of shame. If you've got peers who can tell you stories about how they got through it, peers who can tell you as parents how they came from being behind the eight ball to getting on top of their game as parents. That's as, at least as influential, if not more influential, I think, than specific therapeutic work. Not to say that I think in the context we're looking at here, T may well benefit from specific therapeutic work, but probably in the context of a family-based approach or a dyad with mum or a dyad with dad or with a couple together. So therapy is not about sort of T alone, it's about T with her parents together. Once the kind of bigger issues about the structure and the framework for safety and security are well established and trust is at the core of the relationship. Thank you uh, once again to all our uh, panellists, uh, Courtney Sherman, uh, Dr Mary Salveron and Dr Nick Kowalenko. Really appreciated uh, your insights tonight. Okay, so that's um, moving Thank towards you, the uh, the end of our um, uh, webinar tonight, but uh, there are uh, resources and further reading for you. So um, uh, other supporting resources um, can be found uh, in the supporting resources tab at the bottom of your screen. And of course, uh, for more information about Emerging Minds, please visit, visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au. Uh, so thank you for participating tonight and again we really love it if you could uh, click the feedback survey at the bottom of your screen and uh, be able to provide us with some feedback about uh, your experience time. Certificates of attendance for this webinar will be issued as part of uh, the MHPN's conference and they'll be uh, issued by the end of this month. Each participant will be sent a link to the recording of this webinar and associated online resources within about four weeks.
So this webinar, as we've mentioned, is the final activity in the trauma, the impact of adverse childhood experiences content stream in the uh, MHPN online webinar conference, Working Better Together. So a few words about the partnership between um, MHPN and Emerging Minds. Um, uh, this webinar was a co-production between those, those two um, partners. Uh, the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is, is um, uh, facilitated by Emerging Minds and delivered in partnership with the Australian Institute of Family Studies, the Australian National University, the Parenting Research Centre and the Royal Australian College of uh, General Practitioners. Uh, MHPN supports the engagement and um, the maintenance um, of a uh, a, a practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources and build referral pathways and engage in uh, professional development activities. To learn more about joining your local practitioner network, please uh, visit mhpn.org.au. Uh, and before I close, I'd just like to um, to thank you all, the, the uh, more than 500 of you that, that joined us tonight, and just acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for participating.